Good afternoon. I see I have to lean forward to switch the cameras on. No director, no producer, no floor manager. Those were the days. But you know something? I enjoy this much more. Being on television, I was, honestly, I must tell you, I'm much rather radio than television. I did a series of shows back for Sky TV. And honestly, you, there's things I've got to tell you about it. First of all, I was given an earpiece. And that earpiece connects me to, the, to where the producers, directors, and where they're doing the whole show uh, above. You can't even see them. In some studios you can, but the studios I was doing this in. And you could hear them chatting away. You know, I'm introducing, let's say, um, Jeffrey Archer, Lord Archer, and I, I'm chatting to him. And you can hear people saying, eh, do you want to go out and get a hamburger? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. They weren't Irish, by the way. Do you want to go out and get a hamburger? And you're listening to this in your ear, and you're trying to, to, to do a serious interview about Jeffrey Archer's new book, about time he was in prison, etc., etc. And, and right in the middle of the interview... Like, you've asked him a question and said, well, tell me, Lord Archer, what was it like in prison for you? <clears throat> it must have been a, a rough ride, being who you are. And with that, you hear them upstairs, you're going to commercial break, 10, 9, 8, hurry up, Morris, wind him up. Why? I've just asked him a bloody question and he's answering it. 9, 7, 6, 5, 4, wind him up, wind him up, 3. I would always, oh, Jeffrey, thank you, we're going for a commercial break. And he's right in the middle of an answer. They told me one of the best ways to learn about this is go home, put your microwave on for 10 seconds and learn to wind up in 10 seconds. That's how you practice. Practice with your microwave. <laughs> I'm sitting in the kitchen and it's going, bing, you know what I mean? Big, big, big. Anyway, so it, it wasn't, it just was a, you're under pressure the whole time. Then they made me use a, like cue cards, made me use um, whatever you call it. Uh, well, you, you've got to read, not the questions so much, but the introductions were written for me. And not in the way that I would introduce someone. I'd go, oh, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Lord Jeffrey Archer. You're very... No, no, they would do a whole diatribe or whatever you call it uh, on this uh, auto cue. And, I, and, you know, then, oh, yes, OK, we all have a bit of an ego. And at that stage, I hadn't had the operation to put uh, lenses in my eyes. And then they, it's, I was having trouble with the auto cue, and they insisted I wear my glasses, which I didn't want to do. Um, the trouble I was having is I'm dyslexic, and therefore the trouble wasn't seeing it. It was reading the bloody things because I was complaining. We have well, first of all, you get to the studios. My show was recorded. Th uh, was it four show? Yeah, four shows in one day. Four shows. I can't even remember, but they're half-hour shows, were they four half-hour shows. And so you, what you had to do is you had to change your clothes and everything for each show. So it looks like it's one week, to, it's one month's shows every Friday night. And honestly, it was, um, you go in at about, I think, the car, oh, jeez, me papers are flying everywhere. The car would pick you up at about, um, I don't know, say six in the morning from your hotel. I used to stay in the uh, Cumberland in a marble arch, and then the car would take me. I think they picked me up about 6.30. Then we'd have a, what's called a production meeting and talk about well, who's coming on the show, what's coming on the show. I would fly in on a, sat a Thursday night into London. I would have a car, thankfully, bring me from the airport to the Cumberland. And then I would, on my bed, there's a big brown envelope. And on the brown envelope would have my guests and my autocue cues uh, to read and, and then history of who my guests are. So I didn't really have a very big choice uh, allowed. I, mean, I, I put suggestions forward uh, for it. Uh, but uh, then I would go to the studio at, I don't know, seven, 6 o'clock or something, 7.30. I don't know what time it was, but it was bloody early. I would go to the studio and uh, we'd have a production meeting, go through everything. Uh, then we'd have um, time for breakfast. Well, breakfast, I must say. It was, you know, I'm not a big breakfast man. And then you'd go to the dressing room and get changed and then make up. And then into for the production, your guests would be arriving and you would be doing some queuing, etc., etc., and blah, blah, blah. And then the music starts and the guests would come up, etc. And that's just the way it was. But I couldn't stand this thing in my ear. It was driving me mad. 
uh, TV shows I'd done earlier, you have a floor manager and they wind you up by saying five, four, three, you know, so you'd know where you are. And uh, I remember it was Nessie here, uh, Nessie Woods was great when we used to do Smithwood Productions TV shows here and we'd have some super guests coming in, but it was m much more relaxed. It, it, this was high tension stuff, putting in four shows. Were they one hour? Sh I think they were one hour shows, yes. So four one hour shows in a day and you'd have to wind up by five o'clock. And I must share a funny story with you. I remember winding up a show one day and uh, pretty, you're pretty wiped out by that. And then I would fly back to Spain on Saturday morning. But the driver said to me, Morris, there's a flight this evening to Malaga from, because uh, we were quite close to, uh, was it Gatwick, I think? Quite Gatwick, I think it was Gatwick. Gatwick. Well, anyway, we're quite close to uh, Luton. I don't know which airport we were close to, but we were quite, quite close. And he said, there's a flight this evening to Malaga. Would you like it? And I said, absolutely. So quickly, quickly, we jump in the car. We get, they organise a ticket for me got into the airport and as I'm walking back, you know when you're going to, to uh, for, you know, you have to go through the passport control and you know there's always a line going up and down, up and down. Everybody was looking at me and I thought, God, my show is doing well. Everybody's recognising me right now. That's uh, pretty good. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello. There was no autograph uh, uh, at all, but hello. Yes, hello. And uh, so it uh, got into, into uh, well, you, you know, you wait for your, your, your call, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I went into the, the men's room and I looked in the mirror and there was mascara <laughs> running down my cheeks. Uh, that's what they were looking at. It was just black lines of mascara because I hadn't got time to take my makeup off, but I didn't even know I had mascara on or whatever the black stuff was. And it was uh, quite amusing. But it, those shows were, there was high tension. You know, you got to get it in, you got to get it in an hour, you got your guests in an hour, blah, 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 blah. So honestly, it wasn't, uh, wasn't an easy run. I much prefer radio, and maybe nowadays television is slightly more. And I must, um, must say that uh, I must congratulate Patrick Kilty. But more than congratulating Patrick Kilty, he's now hosting The Late Late Show in Ireland, RT's longest running talk show. Not more than just congratulate him, I must congratulate RTE for, for um, the guests that they're getting. For the guests that they're getting. Uh, and it's the whole show for me has changed atmospherically in every other way because before it was politicians, priests, nuns and etc etc. Now they're all celebrities and it makes the show I know brighter and more fun and more up to date. So well done Patrick Hilde's doing a great job and I'm just jealous I would have loved that show but there was no chance because I you remember telling you in earlier interviews how I sued RT and beat them. Anyway, I'm in bed this morning and I'm looking through the, uh, the, the news uh, and I watch, as I say, three, four news. Uh, I, I watch ITV, BBC, I think I watch Sky, uh, uh, Fox, CNN. I go through all the news services, and I must say I'm watching the Americans especially are covering nearly full time the riots in universe. I don't know how this is allowed. OK, it's free speech. Uh, you're allowed to express your views. Uh, on the war in Israel, uh, the pro-Palestinians. But uh, you're not allowed to instigate violence or, 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 or death to Jews and all this. But now Jewish people in America have uprisen against these people who have been abusing them, spitting them, blocking them to go into, uh, into university. As now they're fighting them on the grounds. The whole thing is getting totally and utterly out of control. Uh, so it, it's got to stop. Also, ceasefire, it's, there's, a, there's a ceasefire agreement on the table, the 1st of May, offered to Hamas. Uh, it's meant to be hugely generous, says Blinken. Uh, and let's hope they take it. I mean, as a Jew, I hope that there's peace. As a Jew, I hope there's no more death in, in Gaza. I hope there's no more death in Israel. I only hope for peace. Shalom. Peace. Peace. Okay, let's just move on. I always say I'm not going to get political. So I'm lying in bed this morning and uh, some, I don't know what it is, there was a photograph, there was, someone came to my mind and I looked him up in, on, the, on Google, uh, a past guest of mine, uh, 
I looked up at Google, but it led me into a newspaper article uh, about me, uh, about uh, so, uh, something that I, I started this iTalk FM radio station. So it was talk of originally REM FM, then it was changed to Talk Radio Europe. I opened another station called iTalk FM. My studios were in the Kapinski Hotel, beautiful studios. Anyway, never mind the studios. So they, there was an article about that. And never mind the paper, it's not important. But after the, an article is written, then you're allowed to, to make comments. Comments, comments. Jeez, I'll tell you one thing. I had never read these before, this particular article. article. Uh, but as I wrote down the, uh, read down the list of comments, I would have committed suicide if I'd read them. I mean, they're just so much hatred. And the odd thing is, I realized as I got halfway down, that 99.9% .9 were coming from two people. And I remember going back to my radio days, these are my two biggest critics. One of them was discovered to be using a false name, he even spelt his name wrong, and the other person was totally bats, mad as a hatter. I barred him ringing up the radio station and barred him that. But the newspaper was probably enjoying this. But thankfully then, on, on these comments, then came... Uh, Someone said I was interviewing a band, for example. This is an example. I was interviewing a band, and uh, they said, I, I wouldn't let the band speak, I wouldn't let them do this, wouldn't let that, wouldn't let that. But then the band wrote in and said, this is nonsense. And we had a great time with Boland on the show. You know, it's these lies, and there's no control over them. The other thing about comments is that it could be the same person 20 times using a different name. The paper doesn't care. This gets the, you know, the article read and everything. But gee, I, luckily, as I, as I finished reading the critics, I, there must have been about 20 or 30 of them, but as I was finishing reading them, the nicer ones were coming in at the, at the end of it. Otherwise, I would have been utterly depressed today. And this is, these, this is 12 years ago, this article. I, but I'd never read the article, and I'd never read the, um, I'd never read the critics. And, you know... You leave yourself open when you're in this business. You put yourself up to be shot down. That's the nature of this business. And as you know, I've been rightly shot down a few times. But was I a bad... Well, there was a book written. Can you see that? Isn't that's not, can you see that? There was a book written, On Our Knees, Ireland, 1972, by a brilliant writer, Rosita Sweetman. I was only very young in my early 20s, much, you know, naive and young. And I just opened my club. And the first chapter in this, the people who are in that book are Cahill Goulding. Each chapter is about a famous Irish person. He's chief of staff of the official IRA, if you don't mind. Uh, Charles Hawhey went on to become well, the Taoiseach, which is like the prime minister of Ireland. Um, uh, who else was there here? Sean McStiffine who was the head of the provisional IRA. Uh, um, so the Reverend Martin uh, Smith, who's the Ulster Vanguard movement, and Robert Cooper, leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland. These are some of the people. Uh, the, the, it says here as a sort of a warm-up, Ireland, uh, let me just say here, Ireland, there are two acceptable reactions to a crisis. The first is to get on your knees and pray to God. The second is to go down on one knee and try to shoot the head off your opponent. Well, that's what, the, what Rosanna Sweetman, uh, the critic, said about the book, or etc. Um, on our knees is important. Agree with it or disagree, but for God's sake, read it. That's what they say, and it's by Pan Books. And it couldn't be, I was the first chapter. And, and I remember meeting Rosanna Sweetman. She says, you're writing a book about Ireland. And you know, your ego is so big at that age. And I just opened Elizabeth's and I'd, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there you are, profile Morris Boland, you see. And, uh, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that, comp I, I suppose I was a little uh, cheeky monkey as a child. So it wasn't that complimenting. There, there's a, a fo photograph of me sitting in Elizabeth's. Can you see it? Um, it sort of said that uh, when Boland invites you and Mr. Boland invites you for lunch, make sure you eat first because he brings you for tea and sandwiches at the Hibernian Hotel. It, I mean, the Hibernian Hotel, I suppose, is equivalent to the Savoy Hotel in London. And sandwiches and tea was just... I, didn't, I don't drink now, really. I don't drink. But in those days, in the afternoon, 
myself and my friends didn't go to a pub. We went to the Hibernian Hotel and we had chicken sandwiches, lovely soft bread with the crust and cucumber and a cup of tea in the pot, you know, with leaves, leaf tea. And that's the way it was. Uh, so I invited her to join me for tea and they, she also said my favorite possession was my mirror. Uh, what I, I, you know, some of it, well, it's, it's embarrassing to read. A lot of articles about me are embarrassing to read. I can tell you that for nothing. And uh, so she wasn't, uh, anyway, I, I actually called her. I said to her, I was thinking of writing a book and I sent her some of the stuff that I'd written and she said that, uh, go ahead, do it. It reads very, very well. But I, you know, we'll see in the long term, we'll see. Um, after the bank strike, it's writing about this. This is an interesting little point. Ireland, of all places, had a bank strike, had two bank strikes, and they lasted for months, months. But Elizabeth's was booming. It was packed every night, and it was booming during the bank strike. Now, you know that in those days, credit cards were very rarely used. I'm not even sure I had a credit card machine in Elizabeth's until, no, I'm not sure. And it was one of these swipey things. Most people in those days paid by cash or by check, and they have a check card, right? And I remember, I'm not going to name names now, but I was approached by one of my biggest clients, one of them, who was, um, who was a, uh, a builder, big builder. And he said, look, Mars, you're getting a lot of cash here. It's not very safe. Why don't you let me take the cash off you? I'll, I'll give you a check for it. And you, I take the cash. I've got to pay wages on Fridays or whatever. And uh, we don't pay by check. The builders want cash because checks are no good to them. And because uh, so, they can't bring it to the bank, they can't get cash out on the check. Uh, there was no cash machines. <laughs> That's true. There was no cash machines. Anyway, um, anyway, I, I was delighted. I was frightened about holding the, the cash. Uh, and I, I sort of made it well known that I'm not holding any cash now that I was getting this guy, this big builder. He had a beautiful Rolls Royce. He was staying in a, a private hotel and everything. And uh, he was a very good customer of mine prior to the bank strike. Anyway, I, during the bank strike, I was so happy, I bought myself a TR6. A TR6. It was the first one in Dublin. You remember them, it was an amazing car, fuel injection, good looking car, convertible. And I bought a TR in beautiful red TR6. I was very proud of it and paid by check. And of course, the garage knew, knew me and knew my family. Anyway, after the bank strike, um, I brought all my, I did have cash as well, but most of it was checks brought to the bank. And the checks were fine because they were, they were given the, on the bank cards were fine. But I remember the price of the TR6, it was two and a half thousand pounds. Two and a half thousand pounds. Imagine that. What's that? Three thousand euros, whatever. Punts. But I'm smiling now. I wasn't smiling then. I got a call from my bank manager, Ulster Bank, which is Nat West in Dublin. I got a call from my bank manager, secretary, uh, Norman Murray's secretary. God bless you, Norman. And uh, Norman wants to see you. And I thought, well, he probably wants to bring me out for some champagne or lunch. He's so happy with the amount of money I brought in. But I went into the bank. It was in Baggett Street in Dublin, walked in, uh, sat down with Norman. I said, Norman, how are you? And he looked, you know, he looked quite glum. I said, what's wrong with you, Norman? He said, Morris, I hate to tell you this, but Mr. X's check, the big one for thousands and thousands and thousands, it, it bounced. Pardon? It bounced. He has no money in his bank. Oh. And it was that deadly silence when I knew that I was broke, practically. And what's more, I'd bought a car. Luckily, there was enough cash to pay for the car. You know that the check that I paid, they paid it with an overdraft. Or they gave me an overdraft but I was destroyed. I went to look for him, but he disappeared. His company went into bankruptcy, and I was in deep, deep, deep trouble. Deep trouble. And what's worse, I was on the border the, the, uh, on the time, uh, within weeks of getting married, and looking at a house to buy. 
I was in deep trouble. So from that moment, walking into the bank as happy as, as Larry, as they say, to this second, being told you're broke. Not through my own fault. Well, it is through my own fault. I was stupid enough to allow this to happen. So it is my fault. Anyway, I, had to, I ended up selling a big chunk of my club to save it, etc., etc. And you know stories about Elizabeth. I told earlier on these uh, at home uh, and personal about the police and everything raiding. But honestly, it was, a, it was a great, great shock to me anyway, and a shock of trust that I learned from. So that's more about it. Before I let you go, I'd like to also mention Esther Ranson very quickly. Uh, you've seen her on the news nearly every day as she is talking about, um, about this, um, cho choosing, to elect, choosing to allow yourself to die euthanasia. Of course, look, you bring your animal who's dying to the vet who says your animal is dying, it will not live, it's wriggled with cancer, whatever, it has, and it's in pain. You put that animal down because you love the animal. Doctors know when you're dying. I watched my father dying. There's no way he was going to survive. In fact, I remember my mother saying to the nurse, give him morphine because he's going to be dead this afternoon, but he's in pain. My mother was a doctor too, and she knew uh, eventually morphine was given and he died shortly after. But all, you know, you could see he was in pain with his forehead, with the sort of lines, the wrinkles in his heart. Uh, but then he just calmed down and he died with dignity and slowly and, and without pain. So Esther Ranson's absolutely right. And I believe that here in Spain, euthanasia is, is legal. Surely, they're not gonna, you're not going to say, hello, doctor, I'm dying. Come and give me an injection and kill me. It's not going to be like that at all. There's going to be a board of, of people who will make up their mind. They'll look at all the, the, the diagnostics, etc., of your situation and your case. And they'll know these are professional doctors and surgeons who will make that decision once you've made the decision that you, you're going to die. Anyway, that's it. Well done, Esther. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for joining me today uh, uh, at home and personal. I'll see you shortly. Bye.